I'm delighted to actually now get to the prime discussion to have welcome our honorees to the, the main stage. I'm going to start and introduce on my far left, our, representing our Nicaraguan honoree, the Human Rights Collective, Nicaragua Nunca Mas, uh, Mas is Gonzalo, uh, Gonzalo Carrion, who's joined with an interpreter. Gonzalo will be speaking in Spanish, but he's worked for 30 years as a human rights defender and an advocate for those who have been victims of the abuse of power. Um, he was the di legal director of the Nicaraguan Center for Human Rights. And after the brutal crackdown by the Ortega regime in 2018, um, his organization under incredible pressure was forced to move to Costa Rica where he's based today. They continue to promote human rights. And he's now, uh, uh, is now president of the Human Rights Collective, uh, which we are honoring, Nicaragua Nunca Mas. To his right, uh, we'll move to Guatemala, and I'm delighted to welcome Helen Mac Chang, Chang back to Washington. She is the president of the Mirna Mac Foundation, of course, and Helen sadly started her fight for justice when her sister, Mirna Mac, was assassinated. And as a result of Helen's work bringing perpetrators to justice, state agents were found to be responsible for human rights violations for the first time in the history of Guatemala. Helen's known nationally and internationally as an advocate in the fight against impunity, in Guatemala as a supporter for peace, democracy, and reconciliation, and for her ideas on how to transform Guatemala's justice, defense, and intelligence institutions. To her right, uh, from El Salvador, we welcome Diego Jacobo, who is the Vice President of the Transparency, Social Oversight, and Open Data Association, or TRACODA. Um, he leads workshops on democracy, transparency, access to public information, use of open data, and the public function as a citizen oversight. He's been a researcher with the Citizen Observatory to the Court of Accounts, an innovative effort to, to track auditing and accountability uh, of use of public funds. Um, he's worked as an analyst on public finance control and auditing the draft of legal reforms on NED-supported projects. Um, and is in addition to that, he's been involved in strategic litigation to push for the right to access to public information. And finally, uh, to my left uh, from Honduras, uh, Jennifer Avila, uh, a journalist and founding editor in chief of Contra Corriente, a digital media outlet in Honduras that publishes in depth investigative pieces. Most recently, and very much in the news, uh, Jennifer and Contra Corriente have contributed reporting to the Pandora Papers. And earlier in her career, she spent time at the Jesuit Radio Progreso as a documentary journalist, and she's covered subjects from national resource exploitation, human rights topics, dynamics of migration and political conflict as gender violence. I want to kick us off by just giving our audience an opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. And I want to maybe, one of the things that we were intentional about and proud of is the intergenerational nature of our awardees tonight. Those who have laid the foundation and been fighting the fight, and those who have picked up the torch and are carrying that forward. And so, Helen, maybe I can start with you. Your story is, is quite uh, painful. and and personal, but share with us what personally brought you into this work today. What decided you, what made you carry on the legacy uh, of your sister for this work and give us a sense of how, what led you to start that foundation. I think it's uh, very interesting. Uh, for me, there was a moment of hope in 2015 when I saw these new generations on the streets and I mean, you know, it was so beautiful to see a new generation trying to change. So for me, it was like, oh, thanks God, I can pass my, my estafeta <laughs> and then go to the ancient council, you know, the council of ancianos, el consejo de ancianos, because it was time to, to, to leave. Uh, but the lesson that we have seen is that the impunity of the past is the impunity of the present. And maybe uh, I would say that um, sometimes they try to erase the memory and they want to separate that um, the human rights of the past doesn't have nothing to do with the present and that's not true. So what we've been experiencing, uh, experiencing today is that um, what we have seen is the intelligence, <laughs> uh, yeah, the intelligence system of the past reloaded, you know, like matrix, they're reloaded. So <laughs> instead of, yes, because now they use the social media, they, uh, but the same thing is, the, uh, they have the same intentions, closed spaces, they want to 
they impose the narrative. They want to kill you in a civilian way by putting you denuncias, you know, suiting you, and so you can be uh, uh, punished, and that will kill you, civilian. Um, and they want to put their own story, their own truth. They don't accept. Uh, they don't accept. I mean, the changes that we have been that we were moving forward. So I think it's. Um, and sometimes the millennials have another way of uh, thinking also, and that's why I'm saying they don't. Sometimes they don't know what happened in the past, and they have other ways of doing things. So sometimes they don't understand us. So having that interchange, talking with them, telling our experiences, listening to them, it's very interesting, and I think it's very constructive. And and I think we have to do this click with uh, the new generations, but they have to learn that the impunity of the past is the impunity of the present, and that erodes the main principles of democracy. I think that's such an important impunity of the past is the impunity of the present. Let's pick up from one of the millennials. Let me come to you, Diego. So you were a successful student at university. What led you to take this path and to form Tracola? Yeah, well, uh, actually, it's quite a funny story because it was about five years ago. We were a bunch of, uh, you know, guys in their guys and girls in their early twenties, and we just had this belief that we as citizens truly are empowered to participate in the political process in the measure that you can access the public information. Uh, now we have this. We had this amazing tool, uh, the public uh, to access to, the public to the access to public information law that really gave us uh, this framework to work where we can um, hold our governments accountable. And, and that was really the, the notion that that, uh, that made us begin with Tracota. Uh, and over the years, that is what we have tried to, to keep going. Again, that, that very basic idea uh, that we have the power to hold our governments accountable that no one is doing us any favor by telling us how they're spending our resources. And it should not be, um, you know, we, we like to say this a lot. We do not really consider ourselves special people. And, and don't get me wrong. I mean, we're very really proud of what we do. But, but really, we're just uh, citizens who are using the tools available to, uh, to you know, promote transparency. And, and like I said, that was five years ago. Um, Sadly, the situation has um, you know, gotten uh, somewhat worse, and now is is a whole lot more difficult than it, what it used to be. But again, that notion that that uh, the ability to participate truly empowers you as a citizen. Thank you, Diego. Thank mm -hmm. you. Can I jump back to Gonzalo? Gonzalo, you have been in this fight for more than three decades in Nicaragua in a tough environment, now doing so from exile in Costa Rica. What led you to be committed to this this cause through all of the challenges you faced over these three decades? And Gonzalo, I think, hit, make sure you've hit the button Perdón. on your microphone. Bien. Yes. Eh, es decir, imposible yo reclamar un derecho si no los creo en ellos. Entonces, y, y, y aparte que existe pues, una declaración ahora universal del derecho a defender derechos, eh, en, en primer lugar esa convicción y tenerlo como filosofía de vida. Y eso este, ya tener como la mitad de la vida en ello ha implicado un acumulado de experiencia y transmitirle que he tenido la oportunidad yo cumplí 60 años en el exilio estamos en Costa Rica junto a mi colega Wendy Flores y un, un grupo de colegas este, defensores y defensoras de derechos humanos que nos vimos forzados al exilio en Costa Rica y probably allow the translator ¿Puedo continuar? Sí, sí adelante okay. entonces este Y ahí aprovecho para señalar de que eh, ha sido duro para nosotros continuar eh, sumando nuestras voces 
eh, en defensa de los derechos humanos del pueblo nicaragüense desde el exilio. A propósito del tema anterior de que, que puede hacer la, la ciudadanía fuera del exilio, fuera en el exilio, eh, no es fácil, como no ha sido nada fácil para el pueblo de Nicaragua su lucha por la libertad. Y entonces, este, cuando uno, eh, como en nuestra, en nuestra experiencia, porque mi colega Wendy ya tiene como 20 años también, llegó jovencita a, al CENIT, y yo llegué eh, recién, eh, ya por terminar mi carrera universitaria en, en Managua, Nicaragua, y el acontecimiento de calle, de la protesta, el tener en, en la balanza que quiero dejar claro acá aquí, y un convencimiento por los hechos. Los gobiernos denominados de derecha y de izquierda violan los derechos humanos, ¿verdad? violentan los derechos humanos. Pero también dejar fijada una idea, nunca como en este tiempo, para nosotros ha sido tan difícil para el pueblo de Nicaragua como en el gobierno que tenemos ahora, si se puede llamar gobierno. Nicaragua está gobernada por una familia que es una tiranía y que niega cualquier tipo de derechos humanos. Y convencidos de ello, nunca hemos dudado de entregarnos por entero a defender los derechos humanos y ahora continuarlos en unas condiciones más difíciles desde el exilio. I'm already taking pity on your translator. <laughs> Can everyone hear me? All right. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. So to begin, thank you very much. Um, I think that in order to defend a cause, in this case, the cause that would be human rights, you have to firmly believe in that cause. You have to believe in it as an option that people can truly live with. Uh, it is so difficult to apply or demand that your rights be applied if you don't believe in them. Uh, currently, we have a universal declaration uh, concerning this conviction regarding the defense of human rights. That is a lifelong philosophy, and I have been in this fight for, at this point, half of my life. Uh, I recently uh, celebrated my 60th birthday while in exile. There are many of us that are in the same situation, Wendy Flores, uh, among many other uh, Uh, advocates of human rights in Costa Rica specifically. It is really hard to continue making sure that our voices remain a part of this defense of human rights. It's hard, just like it's been a very hard battle for the community in Nicaragua to fight for its liberty and its freedom. Wendy uh, entered this fight rather early on. I did when I was just finishing up in school. Uh, I was finishing up college and, you know, and participating in protests, going out to the streets, etc. What you realize is that governments on either side, either extreme of the political spectrum, violate human rights. It has never been as hard as it is now in Nicaragua with the government that we have in place at the moment. This government is made up of a family of tyrants who reject all forms of human rights. So always, this has been something that I've known is worth giving everything to. We know this, and we do this in order to defend and protect human rights. Now, of course, in exile. Thank you so much for sharing that, Gonzalo. Let me jump to Jennifer to bring you in from Honduras. Um, share with us what brought you into this work and, and doing the investigative work that you've done in Honduras is actually dangerous. What's brought you into this work? What's been the most rewarding part of your work as well? Well, I'm a reporter since I was 20 when I started Well, when I was in the university, I I liked the profession. I think journalism is important in the society. I think journalism must investigate and must tell the truth. And I was, as a citizen myself, I was thinking that in Honduras we didn't have like real journalism. So, well, I... I started working as a journalist, and in 2015, with the Indignados movement, 
which was very important to my generation and Kathy's generation <laughs> um, because we lived a coup d'etat in 2009. That was really shocking for, for us, for my generation, that we thought that we will never live something like that, and we did. And then in 2015, all the people in the street uh, was in the all the people in the street asking for anti-corruption fight. And um, well, I thought then, and I met Kathy there, and we were just uh, we we were arguing about the need of journalism in this special point where when in when our generation was asking for. The truth, asking what what is happening with the national resources, and uh, that was like the right question, but we thought we didn't have like the right information, so we kept arguing two years, <laughs> and we founded Contra Corriente in 2017, and um, and we thought, well, this is not only a news media outlet. This should be a school for a new generation of journalists because Honduras need edu needs education first. And uh, we, we build Contra Corriente as that, as a news media outlet, but also school for young journalists and also school for the audience. So we know Honduras is a place where the people needs education. The audience needs to be educated too. So it's a very small and slow job we have to do to educate the audience, to make also the right questions and also to doubt about everything that they see on the news in general. So we don't have many friends in our media, I think. <laughs> but um, I think it has been really fun also, not only dangerous. Um, we we had made this uh, big uh, this big place to for people to come and tell their stories. I think we also are encouraging people to tell their stories to 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 tell how the corruption affects their daily life. And that is helping us also to break silence in Honduras. One of the <laughs> biggest um, things that we have in front of us is that people is afraid to, to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, that silence is very, very difficult for us to, to ask people questions, you know, or, or to go to a place um, to, to, to know what's happening there when people is afraid, when people don't have guarantee of their rights. So I think we have been working on that on these last four years, and it has been really nice seeing people now telling their stories and using our platform to tell their stories and to understand the country. I think also what Helen said, it was so powerful because we said, hey, we need to know our history. And and we realized that our generation didn't know what happened in, in Honduras in the 90s or in the 80s or why Honduras is in this, why democracy failed in Honduras with a coup d'etat in 2009. And so I think uh, we we have that, uh, like that mission also. And um, I am happy with it right now. I don't want to speak a lot of how dangerous it is because I think a lot of people here know that Andres is dangerous, but Andres is dangerous for everybody, for all the people. It's violence everywhere. Where every every space is co-opted by organized crime. So I think that's well known, um, and uh, I think it's very brave for the people, not only for us as journalists because we're we're only like in the middle of the thing but all the people that is speaking out and um, that. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Jennifer. Diego, let me come back to you. You've, you've used some very innovative techniques um, using data, open source data, the citizen observatory. What have you found to be the most rewarding in a way, way place where you feel like you have been able to hold accountable or expose injustice? Well, the most rewarding uh, part of, of what we do is, is when we see the impact that it has when we actually have forced public functionaries to answer what we're asking. Um, you know, in, 
Jennifer has just brought up something that uh, I believe it is true also to El Salvador. Um, what does my generation and the newer generations view as a democracy? How do we leave that? Uh, El Salvador, as most people know, um, just barely 30 years ago was in a civil war that ended, and we have been living in a somewhat democratic system ever since. And I say somewhat because, you know, um, a lot of it didn't work, a lot of the system didn't work. And there were so many things that we just took for granted, and we thought that was that was the way that things are. You know, they're not going to change maybe for the worse, but they won't change for the better. And that was the you know that that was the mindset that maybe a lot of people from our generation uh, find themselves in. And it, it to, to truly believe first in yourself and the fact that your voice counts, your voice matters, and uh, like I said before, no one is asking, no one is doing any favors to you when you're, when you're pushing uh, the political power or when you're pushing public institutions to actually work in your benefit. You know, uh, we tend to believe again that government institutions only answer to higher interest, but they are there for a reason, and the reason is that they have to provide us with answers. So uh, when we managed to do that, on, on the, first, the very first exercise that we did was uh, something related to expenses with Congress, uh, congresspersons. That was back in 2015. And that had a major impact, you know, on media and, and things like that. And, and we were, okay, we're on to something here. Yeah. And we just kind of built upon that. And we, when we, and again, I said this a lot, when we as just a, this bunch of, of young people, um, you know, asking the questions, we were, we were generating this noise that was very um, satisfactory. And, but the most satisfaction that we get is, is when, when we do these workshops with youth groups, uh, with diversity groups as well, when we try and, and, and provide the tools that we have come to know so that they can do the same for themselves. What they ask for is not the same that we ask for, but what we all do is to try and get the government to work for us. And we have seen people who, are, who have participated in our programs who then go on to become public functionaries or do their own thing, and establish their own NGO, and, and to, ha to have the, the, the notion that you played a part in that and uh, empowering citizens to, to work to, towards that end, and that is the most satisfactory. Thank you, Diego. Um, Helen, you have talked, Helen, about the effort to break the cycles of impunity and corruption that repeat itself. And yet, what we've heard from all of you this week is it's not just a sense of treading water, it's a sense that things have gotten sharper. Things are getting more difficult, more complex and more difficult. How have things changed? How do you see, with your perspective on the region, what's happening right now to democracy across the region? How is this different? Apologies if I wasn't clear. <laughs> I think that um, Guatemala and Colombia were the last countries that we had uh, internal conflict, but our countries really never had the vocation of democratic of democracy. We just accomplished the form of we call democracy just by voting, but. Democracy is a lifestyle, and you have to believe in it, just as uh, Gonzalo said. You have to believe in those principles. And when you fight for those principles, they will always accuse us of being communist because they want to maintain the status quo that gave, gives them privileges. And one of the, moving forward, I would say in democracy in our countries was um, judiciary, independent judiciary. So when the judicial start being independent, they didn't start liking it. Less if they were investigating corruption. So 
I guess that there are many factors that makes it complex, like um, organized crime, because corruption or the grand corruption is, it doesn't matter if it's left or right. That's what also in human rights, that what Gonzalo was saying. It doesn't matter if you, it's a left or right government. There is no ideology in corruption. There is no ideology in human rights violations. So when you have a um, judiciary that is independent, when you have judges, prosecutors that really, you know, gives you the idea that uh, the law is equal for everybody, that was a hope. But um, and that's why they don't want democracy, <laughs> and that's why I think that we have uh, we are going backwards because the grand corruption, the kleptocracy systems, is eroding. Uh, uh, the, the democracy. Mm -hmm. And maybe in a, if I can bring Gonzalo in on the regional issue, some of you have talked about how the autocrats have learned from each other in Central America, and that some of the playbook in Nicaragua is metastasizing throughout the region. Can you talk, Gonzalo, a little bit about how you see trends across the region? How has Nicaragua influenced that? But also the converse of that. Luis Botello was talking earlier about the need for a regional approach to respond to the challenge. And is there scope for cooperation, solidarity across civil society to put a break on the backsliding that you see? In the conversations that we've had, en estos días, eh, Nicaragua ha salido eh, mencionada mucho como un mal ejemplo para la región. Obviamente tengo que decir no el pueblo de Nicaragua, ¿no? sino este, la familia Ortega Murillo que está empeñada en perpetuarse en el poder ilegítimamente. Y en la vida eh, los malos ejemplos son como propenso a, a imitarse rápidamente, más en cuestiones políticas. Y definitivamente, eh, en la medida que se prolongue un, un régimen como el que tenemos nosotros, este, estamos tan cercanos que tiene mala influencia. Solo quiero recordar, incluso a propósito de la reelección, eh, cuando la corte nicaragüense le dio... Eh, por la vía jurídica la razón a Daniel Ortega en su eh, pretensión de ser candidato a, prohibido por la constitución alegaron que eso mismo se había hecho en Costa Rica porque ya y como un derecho político humano no se le podía eh, despojar de su candidatura entonces definitivamente los malos ejemplos y particularmente en el caso nicaragüense que la perpetuidad en el poder, la reelección, el continuismo ha sido da dañino, porque nosotros tuvimos, poniendo el ejemplo con nosotros mismos, 43 años con la dictadura somocista, y Ortega tiene casi desde el 79, que siempre ha sido él el candidato, desde el 79, 42 años ya, ¿verdad? Y va por el cuarto periodo consecutivo de forma ilegítima. No hay duda que esa forma de gobernar desde de, de una posición de concentración absoluta de poder es dañina no solo para Nicaragua y, y de, la, de lo que estábamos escuchando de las conversaciones, eh, todos estamos viendo malas señales de esa tendencia autoritaria de los gobiernos y que en definitiva eh, no hay que esperar que el, esa, ese cáncer ¿verdad? Eh, le haga más daño a las sociedades. No hay que esperar tanto. Y, y termino con una, una, una expresión. Eh, este, en Nicaragua, en el 2018, ya habían centenares de personas asesinadas y eh, por estos lados, en la OEA, eh, se discutía si llamar a Daniel Ortega dictador o no. ¿Ya? Y entonces, este, yo, yo creo pues, que en definitiva 
tenemos el gran desafío y particularmente la sociedad de los pueblos en la decisión de vivir en libertad, ¿verdad? Y en el caso concreto de Nicaragua, Nicaragua va a conquistar su libertad por decisión del pueblo que ya tomó esa decisión con su voz poderosa a partir de abril de 2018 y que eh, además de la decisión de nuestro pueblo, es necesaria y legítima la solidaridad internacional. Antes de comenzar una pregunta. In recent conversations that we've been hearing uh, happen over the last few days, Nicaragua has often been cited as a bad example for the region. Obviously, <clears throat> what we see in this area is the family, the Ortega family, that wants to remain in power illegitimately, of course. Uh, and throughout life, you will know <laughs> that uh, bad examples tend to repeat themselves, uh, at least politically speaking. Um, and obviously, if this regimen, if, the, if this regime continues and we remain so close to it, it's going to have a negative influence on the rest of the region. Um, there, of course, is a desire for re-election. And when the, when the court in Nicaragua allowed Ortega to continue as a candidate for re-election, Often what they said was that, well, this has already happened in other countries in the region anyway, like in Costa Rica. So a bad example uh, is what Nicaragua is usually, uh, is usually um, framed as. And obviously this continuation of uh, his candidacy is an example of that negative influence. This has been going on since 1943 with the Somocista dictatorship. Ortega has been in power now since 1979, so that's 42 years. Um, and there's no doubt that this system of governance where you have an absolute concentration of power is negative not only for Nicaragua, but for the entire region. We are able to sense the bad signals coming from this government trend. Um, we should not wait for this cancer to continue negatively affecting uh, our societies. And I'm going to close with uh, one final remark. Um, Nicaragua, uh, ever since 2000, well, I'm sorry, uh, Nicaragua has uh, been dealing with this problem for quite some time. And uh, in 2018, there were already hundreds of people who had been killed. And at that time, here in the OAS, they were starting to ask themselves whether or not they should refer to Ortega as a dictator. Mm -hmm. That's right. Diego, can you pick this up? Because you've also um, talked a little bit. Bukele has innovated, if you will, but you've also talked about some of the commonalities that you've seen across the region. Yes, truly. Well, um, I believe that we, we must talk about El Salvador, Central America in a wider global context of the recession in democracy. And we're starting, well, we have seen in the last years, uh, governments turning towards a more authoritarian uh, sort of, 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 uh, of governance. Um, so you take Central America, for example, and there are a lot of issues that are similar to, to our countries. And if you were to see Central America as, as you know, as, 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 as the region, uh, then you have the two sides of, you know, the two extremes. On one side, it would be Nicaragua, to all of that uh, Gonzalo has described, and on the other one would be El Salvador. Uh, just until very recently, El Salvador had not, not nearly perfect, but at least somewhat working institutions that could be a counterweight to the political power. Uh, you had um, a Supreme Court who sometimes, sometimes would be a true counterweight in checks and balances um, to the government. 
but they had, that has all changed uh, very recently. So we could discuss a lot about what truly constitutes a democratic government, but there are two elements that I believe are uh, paramount to talk about a democratic system and that we don't have that in El Salvador as of now. The first one is something Helen has mentioned, and that is an independent judiciary. It is absolutely paramount to any system, to any democracy, to truly have judges that will answer to a higher interest and to, the, to a higher in, uh, benefits, and not just to, uh, you know, to, to the winds of whoever is in power at that moment. And the other one is a tolerance, but more than a tolerance, a promotion of freedom of the press and freedom of expression. And that is, uh, we should see governments that promote and truly encourage people from the diverse backgrounds, and, you know, whatever uh, the cause that they're fighting for, whether that is transparency, whether that is minority rights, whether that is LGBT rights, environmental rights, et cetera. Uh, they should be tolerant to criticism. They should be tolerant to other views and they should try and engage people who think different from them to, from from themselves to participate in the political process. And at, in El Salvador, we have this worsening condition where it is an increasingly hostile environment uh, to people, you know, uh, independent media and people like ourselves. And again, we we with Tracoda, we we started this just four years ago, and in that very short time span we have seen things deteriorating at, at an alarming rate. I would not say this is irreversible as of now. I believe that there is path to move towards more uh, balanced uh, state of affairs, but things, you know, we need to act now. Now is the moment to do this. And just, just this very close and quick remark, it, uh, a democratic system should not be measured by the amount of people that vote in an election. It should be measured, as I said, in how it promotes and tolerates participation from different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. so. so we do have we do have two elections looming in Nicaragua and Honduras, um, quite different experiences. But Jennifer, maybe in Honduras with elections, I think in a month, what role do you see for media outlets like Contra Corriente? How, what can you play? How do you see media playing an electoral process uh, and how that interacts with what you would expect for democratic standards for an election in Honduras? Well, Honduras is, is coming to a very critic election in November. I, I'm on. Um, we think we're going to repeat or maybe it would be worse than 2017 because we don't have guarantees that we will have a clean election. We don't have um, trust. The citizens don't have trust in, this, in the counting and transmitting data um, system. Um, and also there's this big white elephant called Juan Orlando Hernandez. And, <laughs> who everybody knows who he is and what he's done, but nobody says anything he's not, he has not brought into justice yet. Um, and uh, he also is, um, is in open campaign. You know, you, if he's not a candidate, he cannot be reelected, but he's in open campaign um, now. <laughs> we, we don't really understand who's the presidency candidate for his party, because it seems like he is, is himself. <laughs> um, so we also have been investigating a lot. And one of the, well, the, the real candidate for his party was on the Pandora Papers, for example. And that experience, I want to tell you <laughs> how it was, because this is a presidency candidate that he didn't want to speak with me. He was always closing the uh, the, um, the official events. Contra Corriente journalists are not welcome with him, and he's the, the candidate and the and the mayor of the of the capital capital of of, of Honduras. And um, all the national party has been like very restrictive with the with the independent press, and it has been really difficult to investigate them, but. We have investigated them since uh, all these years, and there is no clean option in that party. And then we have in the other party, in the Liberal Party, 
a candidate that's running for presidency seven months after he came out from the jail here in the US. So these two are candidates for presidency. And then we have um, a new alliance, a new opposition alliance, just as the 2017 with a lot of possibilities to win, but in a co-opted system run by the national party. So what we see is that we will have a very conflictive elections on November and uh, a lot of violence. We already have political violence in the species, but also in the communities, a lot of people that is threatened, candidates that had been murdered in the, in the municipalities, and uh, a lot of things also of the organized crime, reorganizing, trying to, to hold the power that they don't want to, to just give it up on, on November. So mm -hmm. I think journalists, we have no guarantees in this coverage. We covered that on 2017 and no guarantees for the press in the streets covering protests no information, all the official spaces that were closed for independent media. And, um, and we don't have any protection mechanism. We have one, like it's written, that we have a protection mechanism, but it's not practical. And we really don't have protection when we are doing that, that job. And uh, um, I think it's a very dangerous time for, for Honduras. November is very decisive also. But it will it would not be easy as it has not been easy to investigate all these corrupt actors going now on re-election. You know, <laughs> I've been interviewing this same guy, this this congressman that is on the angle list, on the Magnitsky list, in every list you, you can give. Uh, and um, he's re-electing like he's I think he's, he's his sixth period as a congressman. And uh, he's impugned, as a lot of them and a lot of mayors in the same way. So it's really difficult for us to be pointing like an inter and, and investigating corruption and all the Pandora papers and everything, but they're impugning the, in, the mm -hmm. in, in, in the country. So that's very dangerous for the press covering that, that stories. And Gonzalo, just briefly, the election in Nicaragua, which is not a credible election. What is the role, is there a role that civil society can play in the election or after the election? How do you see that briefly? No, ya la, las señales están eh, bastante marcadas. El 7 de noviembre se va a consumar un fraude que ya está este predeterminado porque a final de 2020, inicio de 2021, en, este, a la víspera de un año electoral, se, aprobaron, se aprobó un combo de, de, de leyes en, este, eminentemente represivas para imposibilitar la participación en un proceso electoral eh, con las características eh, para que sea valorado como libre, universal y secreto. No hay en Nicaragua las más mínimas condiciones para, para elección. El 7 de noviembre va a haber votación, pero no hay elección. Eh, en ese sentido, eh, la pretensión de perpetuarse en el poder el 7 de noviembre eh, hace indicar que sí este, mm, lo van a lograr consumar el fraude, pero eh, no está eh, totalmente claro porque Nicaragua está lleno de incertidumbre. ¿Y por qué no es claro? Porque se va a profundizar la ilegitimidad del régimen de Daniel Ortega y Rosario Murillo, ahora mismo lo que compartía este, el señor Zúñiga, la votación de la OEA, 26 votos. Eh, es decir, Nicaragua eh, tiene una tendencia a aumentar la ilegitimidad, a aumentar la ilegitimidad, y este, depende mucho exactamente de lo que yo decía anteriormente, de la voluntad y la decisión del pueblo de Nicaragua de vivir en democracia o sometido a la dictadura. Yo creo que el pueblo de Nicaragua ya tomó su decisión. Muchas gracias. 
first of all, I'll start by saying that one of the challenges coming up is the decision to live freely in Nicaragua. Nicaragua, uh, I would say, has already begun to make that decision uh, through its community uh, starting from April 18th. Uh, international solidarity will, of course, for that reason, be necessary and legitimate. Now, concerning the elections, it is clear that on November 7th, fraud will occur. Um, this is a process that really began near the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, where a series of laws were adopted, repre uh, oppressive laws to essentially make impossible anyone uh, participating in these elections legitimately. Uh, that is to say, there are no conditions for a set of elections that would be free, universal, and confidential. So on November 7th, there will be voting, but there will no be there will not be a true election. Uh, the desire to stay in power, it, we have seen, will likely succeed in this case. But some things remain unclear. Why? Well, because Nicaragua in this situation will see its illegitimate government continue to grow. And just like Suniga said a moment ago at the OAS, 26 votes, uh, Nicaragua is going to continue to have its uh, illegitimacy, illegitimacy continue, I'm sorry, uh, deepen. And much, I think, will depend on, like I said a moment ago, uh, Nicaragua's decision to live freely. And I think that that's something that Nicaragua will do. So as, we, as our members of Congress are beginning to arrive, I want to begin to close us out with a question. Our honorees this week have had an opportunity to meet with administration officials uh, at the White House and the State Department, but also Capitol Hill. And uh, I want maybe, Helen, I'll start with you. Just your expectations, what is your message to the United States, to Congress, to, to policymakers in Washington uh, about engagement in Central America? Um, if you know Helen, you know she's not shy. You have been willing to speak out this week. Uh, please share with us some of those thoughts. Well, uh, what happened is that uh, in our countries, being honest and frank and directly, we have consequences. Rather, whether they will kill you or whether they will put you in a blacklist. <laughs> That's why sometimes when, when I I am very frankly and direct here, I I, I feel. <laughs> but if you're giving me that opportunity, yes. First, I would say that um, I would like that they see us as a region not dividing us from North Triangle countries and Nicaragua side. We are the same. And what it happens to the, to the region, if Central America has a flu, that will impact the US now. And will impact in your security as migration, whatever you wanna call, but also impact us very directly. So for us, it's not dividing us. It's not dividing because the, the policy has to be a foreign policy that has to be applied. And for us, we are not seeing if you are Democrats or Republicans. It's a foreign policy that affects us and we have to work with the administration, whatever administration is. So that's why that foreign policy has to help the region because now we are your border. Maybe in a different, uh, we, maybe we can have different circumstances of Mexico, but we are your border. So that's why I think that uh, you have to, I'm sorry, but I think you have to listen us because sometimes you believe that you are listening us, but you are really not listening us. So I'm sorry if I say, that. I'm sorry. No apologies, Helen. Is she here? Um, I will a testament for whether Well, that's what, what happens. And when we say we need check and balances, if, you really, if we really believe in democracy, we really need check and balances. And the main issue for having check and balances, and I think with Tracoda we've been very uh, on this, is have a judiciary, an independent judiciary. Yeah. When you don't have independent judiciary, we don't have anywhere to go. And really, <laughs> and, and our institutions are very weak. So believe the other people that are in power and what the institutions are saying, and that's a lie. And that's why they listen to the government and they are not listening to us. So we, are, we appreciate that National Endowment has been honoring civil society because maybe by our reports, you're listening to us and reading us that we're saying the truth. 
Helen, thank you so much. I think that is a perfect way to end. If anybody <laughs> knows the endowment, the ethos, it is premised on listening to you. The way we operate is to be demand driven and to understand that this is your fight, this is your struggle, and to figure out what we can do to provide both the material but moral support for what you're doing. And so that's the point of this evening. I think that's a perfect way to wrap this conversation. Our members have joined us, and I think we will transition to the award ceremony, but please join me in thanking our honorees for sharing their views before we honor them tonight. <laughs> <laughs>